My name is Dan Nossel. I'm with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm a rangeland management specialist in Franktown, Colorado. And um, our session today is called Sustainable Rangelands Through Low Input Grass-Fed Production. And this session is sponsored by the American Grass-Fed Association. And uh, they've agreed to, uh, to sponsor our speakers, essentially, to pay for uh, uh, some travel costs and that sort of thing. So we really appreciate American Grass-Fed Association stepping to the plate and, and doing that. I want to make special thanks, or I want to give special thanks to our presenters today, first of all. Uh, we, we have mostly ranchers for speakers today, and, and these folks, uh, you know, took time out of their busy schedules, <laughs> and they are all busy, trust me, uh, to, uh, to be here today to, to prepare the presentations, and so that takes time. And so we really appreciate their efforts, and uh, so we, w we wanted to go more rancher heavy in this, uh, in this session, uh, you know, without the academia research uh, agency, uh, too much of that influence because we want to hear from the people on the land and the folks that are really doing it out there. And we've got some real progressive ranchers here today and, and great speakers. So <clears throat> I'd like to also thank Carrie Balcom with the American Grass-Fed Associ Association. She, she's the executive director and, um, you know, really helped me with the organization of this. Uh, Matt Barnes uh, in the back of the room there, he's a... Uh, uh, rangeland management specialist with the NRCS, uh, really helped a lot, and Harvey Sprock, uh, rangeland management specialist with NRCS. We were the organizers, I guess. Uh, you know, when I first uh, thought about uh, putting this session together, I thought, gosh, we're, we're going to be in Denver for the SRM annual meeting. The American Grass-Fed Association is headquartered here in Denver. The National SRM is headquartered here in Denver, and I just wanted to meld the two organizations together because they have a lot of the same objectives. And uh, so I also wanted to pro provide a forum today to introduce a lot of our SRM members to the grass-fed industry and grass-fed producers because I really believe that grass-fed is the... Uh, um, I guess the uh, meat production industry of the future and uh, that we need to be going more to that and uh, I'd like our SRM folks to be involved in, uh, in knowing more about it. So, uh, so grass-fed versus conventional, um, you know, uh, production without costly inputs. Uh, you can imagine our, uh, the way our current, uh, a lot of our conventional industry is, uh, you know, right after the, the calves are weaned a lot of times, go right to the feedlot, that type of thing, and there's a lot of costly inputs involved with that. Keeps land in permanent vegetation. We don't need all the cropland uh, to produce the grain to, to feed in the feedlot. Uh, reduced or eliminated pesticide use, same thing uh, with our cropland. Uh, needs a lot of that. Uh, greatly reduced soil erosion. If we're not tilling it up every year, then we're not uh, having to, uh, uh, you know, the soil erosion isn't as big of a problem with permanent vegetation. So increased soil fertility without commercial fertilizer. Greatly reduced fossil fuel expenditure. Um, I mean, the amount of fossil fuels it takes to farm uh, compared to just leaving it in native grass or, or uh, some type of permanent vegetation. Um, Increased carbon sequestration with grass-fed or uh, keeping it in rangeland. Uh, increased plant diversity with, uh, again, keeping it in rangeland. You can imagine the, the number of rangeland species is going to be real diverse compared to a monoculture of corn, primarily corn and uh, maybe soybeans and that sort of thing. So it's also better for the animals. I mean, gosh, you know, those poor uh, livestock standing around in a dusty old feedlot being fed corn that they can't digest pumped up with antibiotics just to keep them alive until they can get slaughtered. Uh, improved wildlife habitat, um, you know, the, the rangeland uh, has got a big advantage over that, uh, over cropland. Greater health benefits for the consumer. So anyway, just wanted to do that introduction, and um, I want to go right to our, our first speaker, and um, that, that last... Uh, uh, Great, greater health benefits to the consumer. Meg's going to be talking a lot about that. So uh, Meg Cattell is, is our first speaker. She's with the Windsor Dairy in Windsor, Colorado. Uh, Arden, her husband, and, um, and Meg 
uh, have uh, multi-species. I guess everything they have on the place is organic grass-fed. I mean, they've got dairy. They're, they're primarily dairy, but they also have uh, beef, um, I don't know, hogs, chickens, everything. <laughs> and so they're, they've, uh, and they're, they're both uh, veterinarians, uh, specialized uh, veterinarians. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Meg speak here today. I've heard great things about her. So uh, please welcome uh, uh, Meg Cattell. You're very, oh, that's noisy. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for that great introduction. And uh, I think you pretty much covered the entire talk that I was going to give with that last <laughs> set of slides. So uh, if you look at those slides and maybe get on the Eat Wild site, it's pretty much covered. So I'll just so, show you some pretty pictures. <laughs> um, Carrie Balcom from the American Grass Fed Association asked me to speak to the topic of, specifically her words, the virtues of grass fed for consumers. <laughs> And I think she mostly wanted me to talk about the nutritional benefits, which is something we focus on a lot with our customers and with the education. But I really see it as a, a bigger topic than that and really a lot of what Dan talked about. And I'm going to quickly go through some of those other points as well as a little on the nutrition. Um, my husband and I are board certified dairy specialist veterinarians. We spent a few decades each traveling around the country educating people about keeping their dairy cows healthy. Uh, mostly by feeding them more grass. <laughs> and, uh, and we started our own dairy in 2000. We were married in 99, started our dairy in 2000, started having kids, and that influenced uh, what we wanted to do with our dairy. We consulted for large commercial dairies all over the country, and we wanted our dairy to be not like that. I told them when we got married I wanted to see some colored cows out on grass and make the best food we could make, and that's what we focused on. So um, <clears throat> I'll show you a little bit about our dairy and intersperse it with um, some of the concepts that I think are really important about grass-fed. This is our logo for our dairy. It says, uh, for the love of cows and people, and I guess it now has to say, for the love of uh, cows and sheep and chickens. And, uh, <laughs> and we made this food for our family, and we saved some for you. The reason we say that is because our goal with our farm is to produ produce the highest nutritional quality food that we can without sparing any effort. So it is exactly the quality that we would produce if we just had, you know, uh, if we were just producing food for our family. And that is our uh, mission, to keep it at that quality for all of our customers. So I thought I'd start uh, exploring this topic by looking at what virtues are. Um, According to, this is not Webster, but uh, dictionary, web dictionary or something from my iPhone. <laughs> Virtues are moral excellence, goodness, or righteousness. And I think that's interesting because a lot of people do this kind of farming because it makes them feel good and because it's what they believe in. And if we can afford to do it, it's a great way of life and a great way to keep our families involved. It's also conformity with one's life, of one's life with ethical principles, and I would say that's true about what we try to do with our farm. And uh, another definition of virtue is an effective force, a power, a potency. So, for example, a charm with the virtue of removing warts. I thought that was funny. So what are the virtues of grass-fed beef or organic grass-fed milk? And I came up with this list, which is a lot like Dan's list, and these are virtues to the consumer because people buy our food because of these things. Not just the nutrition, but because of their value set. And for environment, I'm not going to go into the science of all of these. I am sort of uh, usually speak to the science, but I'm just going to tell you the basic concepts that we think about. So soil and water conservation, again, organic matter, and car organic matter building and carbon sequestration. Um, I think it's really important. We're very heavily involved in the organic movement. Arden's the president-elect of the Western Organic Dairy Producers Association. We get really involved in um, sometimes what's going on in Washington as far as the organic movement goes. Um, and one thing that people miss a lot in the modern organic movement, they think it's all about just removing pesticides and antibiotics and GMOs. But when organic started, it was really about nutrient cycling 
and including the decay cycle and um, composting and all those things were extremely important, building soil nutrient levels. And um, one of the basic tenets that was discussed in the early organic literature is that all organic farms should include a livestock cycle. So the pasture phase was to build soil nutrients and organic matter and nitrogen levels, and it was incorporated even to crop, into crop production systems. And uh, a couple of little things about how our manure is different, because when we get into the soil science, it makes a big difference, and wildlife and plant diversity and carbon footprints. So, This is a slide of the Great American Desert with a little water applied to it and mob grazing. This is my friend's biodynamic farm right down the road. We do our pasture mixes together. And he took that land from so sparse you could barely jump from one clump of bunch grass to the next with mob grazing and some well-timed irrigation in our pasture mixes to it was more than knee-deep in grass last year. And it was a very, very impressive transformation to me. Those aren't Holsteins, but they are milk cows. Actually, those are um, um, American Devons and milking shorthorns. They're very endangered. Um, breeds of dual purpose cattle. Um, I already talked a, li a little bit about traditional farming systems, including livestock. So here's some of our pastures with some of our dual purpose cows out there. Those are being raised, those are the bull calves being raised for beef. I think one of the things that really struck me, one of the best talks I ever heard on soil science, I learned more in three hours from him than in reading any soil science book, was done by. Um, Francis Tickey, have any of you ever heard of him? He's a PhD soil scientist who worked with um, Ag Research Service for his whole career. And then he started 100% grass-fed um, grazing dairy in Iowa. And he showed us a fantastic set of slides, but one of them that sticks in my mind was a, a soil profile on this farm that he bought that was highly eroded after he'd been uh, had it in permanent pasture for 10 years. And he had built so much topsoil and so much root mass, it was more uh, impressive to me than any of the science that I've seen in the statistics. But one of the things he talked about was applying manure. You know, we're always trying to get um, up to a balance point as close as we can with nitrogen levels and organic matter and, and specific uh, micronutrients. And Yet when you look at the data, all that you see with dairy manure and hog manure and poultry manure is that you can get to very toxic levels of phosphorus in the soil when you apply too much manure. But when you're doing 100% grass-fed farming, guess where the phosphorus comes from? Does anyone know where phosphorus comes from in manure? It's almost entirely from the grain feeding. So you don't run into those issues with constant manure cycling on permanent pasture because the phosphorus levels aren't out of balance. Um, and that's part of why we focus on, as much as possible, a closed loop of nutrients on the farm. So that's one, this is one of our most important local species of wildlife. My <laughs> husband and I, you probably can't see more two excited veterinarians overseeing dung, dung beetles swarming around in cow pies. And uh, when we first saw them on our farm, which was about... I think the year after we went organic, we both stood there for a minute after we jumped up and down and said, do you remember we've probably been on thousands of dairy farms, including some partially grazing dairies like in the south, and we don't remember ever, ever seeing dung beetles on a dairy farm. That's how different the system is. Um, we did another little exercise on species diversity, when we had uh, the slow food chapters out, we like to do dinners on our farm and we do all of our own food and cook it out there and have people eat in the barn. And the last time we did one, one of our cows decided to visit us and walk through the entire dining area. Fortunately, she didn't turn all the tables over, but uh, that was exciting for some people, including me. Um, but for them, I had them drive by in their chartered buses a typical conventional dairy and take a look around. It was a dairy I used to work for just across the highway and then come over to our place. And I made a list of what our species diversity was when we bought the farm. When we bought the farm in 2000, it was all in corn row crops. It had probably been in corn since about 1870. Very compacted soil and not a, I hadn't seen an earthworm except in the yard. 
And um, so it was in row crops and about 500 Holstein cows in feedlots. And um, what else? There were maybe an occasional prairie dog. And uh, when they sold it to me, they'd just gotten a, a wildlife. They were trying to sell it for development. So they had the wildlife department out to assess the wildlife value. And they said the only thing that, only wildlife that ever appeared there was the Canadi uh, occasional Canadian goose. Well, I did my list of species diversity of just animals we'd seen, animals and plants and microorganisms that we'd seen in the last year, and it was over 100 items. And that was just impressive to me to do that exercise. Um, one of the things we really focus on is not just, the an not just for the animal's sake, but for our sake and for the sake of conserving the area in which we intend to live our whole lives, um, bringing back uh, diversity to the pastures. And we actually spend a tremendous amount of time, uh, including with my neighbor whose farm I showed you, trying to figure out what types of forbs and legumes we can put into our pasture mixes um, that are non-toxic to livestock and that um, will do things for the nutrition and flavor of our products including um, helping with subsoil, uh, breaking up the hard pan with plants, um, helping subsoil nutrients come up so we don't have to add micronutrients to our soil or to our cows, and uh, doing tremendous things with flavor. There are some really interesting studies. Um, one was done in Switzerland, one was done in Sardinia, where they looked at flavor profiles of traditional cheeses, and we make cheese. And one of the things they found allowed both the electronic nose and HPLC and trained taste testers to differentiate cheeses were the Girinol from, um, it's an insecticide that plants produce when they're being predated, um, from wild geraniums and other flowers. And they had tremendous flavor on the cheese and potentially even some nutritive properties in the people. And in Sardinia, when they did the same thing, and they had grad students doing what they do best out there, recording. They were uh, recording every bite the cows ate and what they ate first. And the first pass over a field, over 50% of what the cows ate were compositaceae, so daisy family flowers. Over 50% of their dry matter. But it's not important. So what about our carbon footprint? I put a couple ideas down about it. We don't do any tillage anymore, but we do a little drilling of other uh, plant species into our fields all the time, trying to improve the diversity. Occasionally we do some mowing, for mostly for um, thistle control. Uh, now we control our thistles with sheep and goats. We, we really focus on this. Um, we, try, we do no chilling, pumping, or heating of our cheese milk. We do it all completely traditionally, so it comes at cow body temperature through our filters, and then we make it into cheese. We, and all of our products, unless someone begs and puts it on the airplane in their suitcase, are sold within 100 miles of our, of our farm. And one of the things that was a fun lesson and exercise for me, it wasn't fun at the time, but in retrospect, um, we had the tornado come through our place in, on May 22nd and took out 200 power poles and laid down about six inches of uh, three-inch diameter hail. And um, we didn't have power up at part of our farm for another week. And I said, and another dairy down the road was almost annihilated because all the animals were inside and under a clear span building and sheet metal was flying everywhere and got cut about 20 cows and it was a complete disaster and they went out of business. And people thought it was our farm. We got a lot of phone calls from people we hadn't heard from in 20 years. But uh, having all those animals out there without the modern conveniences made us realize that this was a pretty decent model, you know? Cows can eat grass and drink water and really survive. And when you're a dairy farmer, that's not something <laughs> that you really think about. Most dairy farms can't survive for an hour. So another concept and sort of my standing joke is um, we still interact a lot with the conventional dairy business and we get Feedstuffs magazine and a lot of other professional journals and every issue of Feedstuffs there's some new additive that they're going to feed to confinement hogs that are on concrete and never stick their nose in the dirt. This is uh, our boar Patrick of a, an almost extinct breed. 
And the latest thing they added was uh, a yeast derived from the coating of apples was going to improve their, their uh, gut health. And before that, it was lectins and oligosaccharides and fiber. And I said, if they're not careful, we're going to reinvent the apple. <laughs> <laughs> and so from that same pers perspective, we went from this 500 cow feedlot confinement row crop dairy and we milked 500 organic cows. We had them on 1,000 acres of pasture we hand irrigated. Um, and now we're down to 80 dairy cows and other species. And we keep going backwards. So we've even, uh, so we've changed the breed profile. We've taken old feedlots. And uh, much to the discouragement of everyone else in the neighbor who said it was impossible, turned them back into pasture. <laughs> I wish I had some aerial slides of that. I will one of these days. So we've been making permanent pasture with mixed forbs and lagoons. Um, we want natural shade and shelter, and we want clean water, and we want healthy cows that live a long time. And this is what we feed them. This is some of our pasture. You can see it's fairly diverse. That's High Plains Coreopsis they put in there by accident. It was real pretty. <laughs> the cows ate it. Um, and Sainfoin and Salad Burnett and all sorts of native and non-native things. And I said, if we're not careful, we're going to reinvent the prairie. So we're sort of dairy ranchers more than we are dairy farmers anymore. Um, animal welfare, second topic. So what are some of the things that are important there? I think, you know, the organic rule talks about selecting breeds and managing them for the environment. And that's something important to us. And that's why we've done a lot of crossbreeding with dual purpose cows or cows that have been used for cheese production in Europe for for centuries, and some of them, like this one in the back, that's a Vosgen. We have one of the two Vosgen herds in the country, and they're a lineback breed from the Vosges regions of France, and they're used to make traditional Munster cheese. And their milk, and the one of our other more common breeds besides Brown Swiss, is um, Tarentais, not beef Tarentais, but dairy Tarentais. Their milk has been used for an AOC label cheese that does not allow any grain feeding. So those animals have never been adapted to grain feeding. And they don't produce a huge amount of milk, but they produce the same as our high producing breeds on no grain. And they breed back and they keep their body condition and they live a long time. Here's some of my neighbor's cows. And they're the same way. So what are some other animal welfare values are just access to their natural living conditions, pasture and freedom of motion. We actually do have a barn that we put feed in just to keep it covered, which is just uh, ground hay, and a covered water area that they can move in and out of when they want to, but the rest is all rotational grazing, and they can move in and out of the pastures and the barns whenever they want to. And freedom of disease, this is a really important thing to my husband and I, and it's really what we met about at a dairy science conference. And uh, we really think it's important. As veterinarians, we both arrived at the same position. Why are we out there in the middle of the night putting a prolapsed uterus back into a cow when it's preventable with nutrition? Why are we watching all of these first calf heifers die of BRSV because they have acidosis? We knew it was all preventable, and no one was really looking at it at the time. And that's what we spent our careers doing. And just to show you a typical example um, from many, I used to run dairy research trials. And so there are really hard numbers on annual incidence of clinical mastitis in dairy cows. And in almost every study, they stack up around 35% annual rate clinical mastitis. In our organic herd, even before we were 100% grass-fed, when we milked 500 organic cows, we had six cases of clinical mastitis in a year. And we don't even think about it anymore. We actually did have one this year, <laughs> one that calved after a wet spell when she'd been dry and it was a little muddy out. So that's, that's a pretty important difference, do you think, to dairy cows? I watch some of these animal welfare movies, and they talk about, oh, separating the calf from the cow and tail docking and all these things. And Arden and I just scratch our heads and say, you know what? I don't think that's what the cows care about. If a third of them have painful clinical mastitis and a third to two-thirds of them have lameness in a lactation, I think that's what they care about. Mm -hmm. So what else is a big animal welfare to us? And that's culling and death loss. So the conventional culling rate according to AFIS statistics, I think that was a 2008 study, was 37% death plus culling. Death loss runs about 10% on a national average on an annual basis in dairy cows. In our client herds, it runs around 
When we had our large organic herd, it was 16%, and now that we're 100% grass-fed, it's about 7%, and the only real driver to culling is that we have more cows than we want, and we raise all our heifers. So I always asked my husband this question. We'd go and visit farms, and we'd, we always did. Uh, he invented some statistics that everyone uses now, like cow comfort index and cud chewing index and that sort of thing, which we graph for all our clients. And we'd always find ourselves standing in the coolest area of the barn and saying, you know, the air is pretty good here. You know, <laughs> the sun's just right. And I'd say, where would you like to be a cow? I wouldn't mind being a cow in this herd. And I asked him that question the other day. I said, compared to the best client herd that we have, would you rather be a cow in that herd or our herd? He goes, oh, I don't know, that might be a toss-up. And I said, okay, let's go back to that other slide. Would you rather have a 7% chance of dying or a 37% chance of dying? <laughs> That's a pretty easy decision for me. Okay. This is really what uh, I was asked to talk to you about, and I'll see if I can focus on this a little for you. So one of the things we really think about is the macronutrient and micronutrient concentration in our milk. And it took us a little... Uh, mind shift to go from saying, well, the cow is producing X grams of conjugated linoleic acid a day, even if she's making 80 pounds of milk. But how much are you getting in one glass of milk when you're drinking it? <coughs> so concentrating the nutrients for the consumer is what we had to think about. Um, just on a crude macronutrient level, conventional whole milk you buy at the store, and most bulk milk that comes out of dairy farms is about 3.2% fat and 2.8% protein. On an annual average, we run about 4.5% fat and 3.8% protein. You can take the fat off the top and that milk is still beautiful, white, and dense and not gray and watery looking. And in the winter, the fat concentration can go up as high as 5.8%. And a lot of people do seasonal um, calving of their cows that make cheese because they like to make good grass, green grass cheese milk. But one of the secrets we found is that uh, some of the best cheeses are made with winter milk because the fat level is tremendously high. And so we can make a brie without even trying to in the middle of winter. Here are the big topics, omega-3s and CLA. How many of you uh, know about the benefits of omega-3s and CLA in grass-fed products? Yeah. They're pretty important. It's why we do what we do. Is it, what's the largest health problem facing people in the Western world? There was a headline in the, what was the paper? It was one of the main British uh, newspapers on the cover, and it said omega-3 deficiency is the largest health problem facing the Western world. And that was from the International Society of Lipid Chemists. Of course, they'd think that. <laughs> omega-3 deficiency has been linked to heart attack, stroke, cancer, obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes, asthma, the whole list of basically any inflammatory, chronic inflammatory disease is influenced by omega-3s and a whole bunch of neurological diseases because the brain is made up of fat. <laughs> um, the big distinction in polyunsaturated fatty acids is between omega-3s and omega-6s. I'm not going to go into the chemistry of it, but I do want to tell you that the typical Western diet is about 15-6, 15, 15 to 1 of omega-6 to omega-3. And 6s are the inflammatory unsaturated fatty acids. And the desired level is 3 to 1 or less. Um, where do we get it all from? I got a little pointer here. Let's see. Here are where all the omega-3s come from. Seafood, fish, grass-fed dairy. Grass-fed meats would be down here too. Conventional meats typical dairies, nuts and oils are very high in sixes. And this is really important. Um, up here is sunflower oil, safflower oil, sesame, corn, palm, and we get down to soybean. So what are we feeding dairy cows? 40 to 60 percent of their diet is corn and soybeans. And so they have tremendously high levels of omega-6s in their diet and saturated fats, and they're getting fed things like bakery waste and other things that have uh, other unhealthy fats in them. They're being fed trans fats even. Um, typical milk then is uh, there was a lab in, at Utah State where we were running our samples quarterly, and they had some really good baseline information. Typical conventional milk is about 15 to 1, omega-6 to omega-3. If you supplemented them with flaxseed or other sources of linoleic and linolenic acid, you could get it much lower because you raised the threes. 
Um, but grass-fed milk, 100% grass-fed milk on good green pasture was by far the best. Um, <clears throat> the same thing holds for conventionally raised eggs and free-range chicken eggs, which we produce for our customers. And you can see the influence, too, in beef, pasture-fed. This may not be 100% grass-fed, because 100% grass-fed should be getting pretty close to the level of wild game. And I know there are people here who can produce uh, grass-finished beef that's getting close to salmon in its concentration of omega-3s. So super important thing, and this is one of the uh, illustrations my husband loves to use, the Lyon Diet Heart Study conducted in 1994. Most doctors have never heard of it, and they need to. Uh, it was a study done in Lyon, France, where the control diet was given to 302 French heart attack survivors, and then the experimental diet was uh, also given to those people, and that was the Crete diet, which had actually more fat, but most of it was omega-3s. Um, they were from plant sources in this study. And four months after the start of the trial, they already had a difference in survival rates. That's never been shown before or since in any heart disease control study. The survival gap widened each and every month afterwards. After two years, they halted it due to ethical considerations for those on the control diet. What level of heart attack reduction do you think would be important? We talk about controlling our lipid levels in our blood and all these sorts of things. Most of the effects that are loudly touted are in the 2 to 5% range. What do you think would be a meaningful level? Here's the control diet. Now this is survival, okay? You've had a heart attack, you're put on a diet. Here's your chance of being alive 36 months later. And here's your chance of being alive on the alive on the omega-3 diet. Think it's meaningful? The Crete diet page, patients had a 60% less chance of suffering a second heart attack. And even more shocking, they showed 76% lower risk of dying from cardiovascular disease during the period of the study than the control patients. What do you think the control diet was? The standard American diet? The control diet was the American Heart Association's Prudent Heart Diet. Yes. <laughs> Still recommended, by the way. Don't do it. <laughs> That's our son Sam with one of his uh, one of his farm animals. <laughs> Conjugated linoleic acids, the other really important one. It's a very potent, naturally occurring cancer fighter. We only get it from ruminants. It's probably more important than we know. It was discovered, I don't know if any of you know this story, but CLA was dis discovered because scientists were trying to figure out why humans for millennia had been consuming charred meat, which contained polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, bad cancer producers, and lived through it. It wasn't only because sometimes we died from a knock in the head at the age of 35. It was because there were other factors there in real natural meat, and CLA was that factor that they found. It's found naturally in all ruminant products because it's made by the rumen microorganisms. It's not found significantly anywhere else. It is found in some hindgut fermenters in lower levels. Um, that's a polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid. You don't need to know that, but it's very, very different from the rest of the PUFAs. It has power. Anything that contains milk fat, anything that contains beef, beef fat, lamb, mutton, goat fats, all the wild game fats, not just the lean meat. There's a little in some of these hindgut fermenters. It's not in tofu burgers, soy drinks, fruit juice, vegetable oil. <laughs> it's found only in ruminant fat. If you eat no beef or milk fat, you get no CLA. Um, the average American eats 20 to 33 percent of the research proven, um, extrapolated from cancer studies, uh, proven cancer preventing dose of CLA. Seventy percent of that intakes from dairy in the average American diet and 25 percent from beef. That's with conventionally raised livestock products. Um, what happens if we raise them in a different way? Same sort of thing as omega 3s. And Here's milk cow diet and CLA output. So four uh, milligrams per gram of CLA in a typical cow diet. If you add forage, 
if you have uh, add a polyunsaturated acid source, which would be uh, usually uh, oil seeds, and then on all pasture. So we got four times the level here, and we said we're getting a third of the cancer preventive dose with our typical American diet. Seems like a good investment to me. This is uh, the, before the lab closed, one of the last samples we did. This is actually our winter sample when we were still feeding grain, okay? Our CLA was almost double um, with grain in confinement in the winter, and our omega-3s were what, five times higher? And now they're even more extreme, but I don't have the latest data because we can't find a good lab to do it. Um, we're working on that right now. It's among the most potent naturally occurring anti-carcinogens. It actually uh, is a, ca a cancer preventative and, and works to reverse some stages of cancer. Um, it's probably an extremely important factor in breast cancer. In, uh, in rodent models, it's been shown to be effective in all the standard rodent models against, see if I can get the list now, breast, prostate, lung, colon, and skin cancer, I think. Um, breast cancer is extremely important. 43,000 women in the United States die of it every year. It's the number one cancer killer of women in the world. This to me was the most interesting data. Um, there were two different studies done in Scandinavia. One was that women with the highest CLA intake, which was almost entirely from grass-fed dairy, grass-supplemented dairy, had the lowest incidence of breast cancer. It was highly significant. And then they did another study where they took biopsies of cancerous breast tissue and biopsies of normal healthy tissue and found that in the breast tissue that was cancerous, there were significantly lower levels of CLA. We're getting pretty close to a proven hypothesis there. If I was gonna err on the side of caution, I'd be eating my CLA. Whoa, time to wake up everyone. <laughs> Ignore that. Another really important point, and I don't have time to go into it in great detail, is the fat soluble vitamins. Um, read the works of Weston Price and read modern literature on vitamin D deficiency. Uh, the fat soluble vitamins most of us are getting about a tenth of what we need to be getting, and it really needs to be gotten from whole food sources. And one of them we're just learning about in the family of quinolones is K2. K2 and silica are probably more important for bone density than vitamin D and calcium are. And where do you get them? The only place to get K2 is from grass-fed dairy or fermented natto, which is a bacillus fermented soybean that they serve in Japan. Those are the only two known sources that are at all significant. And uh, my personal anecdote on that, for my birthday I did a physical exam and had my bone density tested, and mine runs about 125% of my age group. I attribute that to uh, lifting heavy things, running around, and eating K2. <laughs> so what else about grass-fed beef? It's leaner, it's less saturated. If you take our butter, actually I tell our customers to do this all the time, with any of the meats that we sell, if you cook it and you pour off the fat, it's still liquid and somewhat clear at room temperature. That's a really good test of fat saturation. If you take our butter to room temperature, it's like whipped butter because the fats are so unsaturated. It behaves very, very differently as a food and it behaves very differently in your body. And uh, because we're talking about virtues, I thought I should say also that it removes warts. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but so if we're not careful, we're gonna reinvent real food too. <laughs> Some of the other quick things really quickly, but very important, acid resistance and antibiotic resistant pathogens, pesticides and GMOs. Um, there are loads of studies on this. If you get on the Organic um, Center website, you can see some a paper I did on this, but um, 404 environmental bacteria from 93 California dairies um, had antibiotic resistance, most of it to non-mastitis antibiotic treatment. So feeding calves Medicaid milk replacers, treating cows for pneumonias and metritis, that sort of thing, foot rot. Um, and I'm sure you all know about the studies. Um, what was his name? We met him on the airplane, Russell. Um, feeding hay before slaughter reduces acid-resistant coliforms by several logs. A lot of people take this to mean that E. coli 157H7 is at lower levels always if you feed more forage. What we do know is that acid-resistant coliforms are at lower levels if you feed more forage. There are some other really good studies. There was one on Campylobacter in Australia 
where they compared uh, a group of weaned calves that they took either to the feedlot or they took to pasture and gave them no grain. And they took the Campylobacter level, level shedding in manure from 87% to zero. Now, other studies are more equivocal, but that one was very clear. Um, and of course, you can't just do that study on any old group of cows because you can't find 100% grass-fed animals to do the experiment on. Pesticides and GMOs, are they important? Again, I have a set of slides on that at the um, Organic Center site. And there are three, there's a lot of talk thrown around in the lay press about whether or not there are pesticides in beef and milk. And no one seems to look at these three huge data sets that are generated every year from the USDA and FDA. And the one that really shocks me is their animal feeding study. Um, the last date I had was from 2003, but dairy cattle feed sources, so alfalfa, corn, corn silage, soybeans, out of 438 domestic samples, 30% of them contained residues. A third of the pesticides they tested for were there. Eight samples had 11 residues that exceeded the limits exceeded the limits, and those limits aren't exactly uh, stringent. And some of the residues included things like lindane and heptachlor. Those are nasty, nasty pesticides. Um, BSC as a food safety issue, impossible if they're 100% grass-fed. Quickly, cultural tradition, I think, is other consumer values. We really think about farming systems that are important for the region. Uh, we're using river water and we try to use it as sparingly as possible and use, return it clean to the river. We want to have a food system that can survive in the area. Our apple orchard's on an area that was first settled by the French fur trappers. It still has bears and mountain lions in it. Still has choke cherries. We don't have any bison. If we could milk bison, we might maybe would do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we went through the kraut burger and burrito stage and now we're at the fast and slow food stage and we're on the slow side of that. And uh, there are European people here with their, their allies, the cattle, and that's the food that we eat. But we do uh, breed conservation. We have the Vosgean, Abundance, and Tarantese cows heavily in our mix. We use sheep and goats for weed control and produce products from them. We're conserving speckled Sussex pullets, which is an, uh, an endangered breed for the American Minor Breed Conservancy and Gloucester Old Spots Pigs. And here's Eleanor and Patrick relaxing after their breed conservation efforts. <laughs> uh, we do traditional food processing. We make creme fraiche and cottage cheese and fresh mozzarella and big balls that we roll up. And we make uh, cultured buttermilk and products you can't see anywhere anymore cultured butter. We also make all these traditional cheeses with natural rinds that uh, we have a lot of European customers that come to our market in Boulder and say, you saved my life. There's something I can eat. <laughs> and we do 100% grass-fed organic beef and lamb and we're working on the pork or Eleanor and Patrick are working on the pork part of it. And uh, we feed kelp and flax and everything to our hens who are outside. We make cheese because it's the storage <laughs> form of milk. I'd love to tell you the story if I had time about our natural rind uh, apple cider wash cheese. I'll do it quickly. So the organisms that grow on these things, the bloom on the apple that I showed you, those yeast organisms, and other organisms, the lactobacilli, um, they propagate in the environment. And you create your own microenvironment for those organisms. And, and they'll inoculate your creamery and your cows. And they've found that some of those lactobacilli and streptococci are plant grass shoot stimulants. And the same ones colonize the muzzle of the cow, and they colonize the udder of the cow, skin, and they're the ones that allow you to make completely natural, traditional style cheeses. So it's a whole micro ecosystem. And it, ha it was a big switch for us to think from the veterinarian's viewpoint where you're talking about annihilating pathogens to propagating the right organisms. And the last big important thing as a consumer value is that it be friendly, friendly farming, like Joel Salatin says, less equipment, less toxins, places to play. And uh, my friend Dan James from Durango said, you have to give the next generation memories that will make it impossible to leave the farm. <laughs> Here's our marketers in training. We think it's really important to incorporate beauty in their lives, picking apples with the bucket truck from 60 foot tall trees, playing with the chickens, 
And Sam says he wants to be a peach and toad farmer when he grows up. <laughs> One day he collected 35 toads and brought them all in the house. I don't know how many made it back out. It's important to have fun, making food and having fun, swimming in the stock tank. Um, we produce this food for our family, save some for you. We have a couple of uh, PowerPoint presentations on omega-3s and CLA on our website, which is windsordairy.com. Welcome to come and visit it, and you can uh, send us messages there if you'd like. Thank you.